Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Executive Editor of Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this month's installment of the monthly DEMA International Webinar Series. This webinar series is designed to give our Enterprise Data World Conference attendees education year-round. This month, Alan Duncan will be discussing influencing with data. Facts don't matter much. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag DEMA. If you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the top right for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of the session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me formally introduce today's speaker, Alan D. Duncan. Alan is a research director for Gartner's Analytics and Business Intelligence Research Team. We're very excited to have him today. An evangelist for information and analytics as enablers of better business outcomes. He has over 23 years of international business experience working with blue chip companies in a range of industry sectors and was formerly director of data governance at the University of New South Wales. Originally from Aberdeen in Scotland, Alan has worked extensively across the UK and Europe, the Middle East, and Australia. A popular and thought-provoking speaker and tutor of the, on the international conference circuit, he has been recognized by informationmanagement.com as one of the top 12 data governance gurus you should follow on Twitter. And with that, I will turn over the presentation to Alan to get us started. Hello and welcome. Hello. Thank you. Uh, hi there, folks. I was about to say good evening, but that's because I'm speaking to you from the UK. It's uh, probably afternoon or even morning where uh, you folks are. I uh, hope you're having a good day. Um, I'm delighted to be here um, for, uh, for this uh, webinar event uh, to uh, represent some of the point of view that we are collecting uh, in our research at Gartner. Um, most of you will be, I guess, familiar with Gartner, but for those of you who may be a little less so, uh, Gartner is the world's leading uh, technology uh, market analysis and research firm, um, providing uh, research advisory services uh, worldwide with over a thousand research analysts covering every aspect of uh, technology for business. Uh, and I am one of a team of about 40 analysts covering the uh, market in respect to all things related to data analytics. Um, the session we have for you today will not talk about technology much. Um, I'm going to be looking much more at some of the human and behavioral aspects of how do we succeed using data and analytics to try and um, move forward the data-driven culture. Um, and what I hope to show you over the next uh, hour or so is that as we're trying to influence with data and analytics, the facts actually don't matter much, not at least until we've dealt with the human factors. So it would be nice to think that Carl Sagan had it right, that we can all be rational creatures, that thinking with our brain is the right thing to do, and that not using our gut is uh, the advisable approach because it's not really what it was designed for. But unfortunately, I'm not sure Carl was right. Um, I'm not sure he, that we are actually rational creatures. And I think perhaps that uh, Albert Einstein was closer in terms of thinking that two things are infinite, the universe and human stupidity and then not being so sure about the universe. You know, when we look at um, behavior of people every day, our colleagues, our friends, politicians, folks in social media, and not forgetting ourselves, we actually do things that ain't so smart. You know, it takes a lot of energy to get to doing things in a rational way and sometimes we struggle. However, if we understand that and recognize the nature of folks uh, in terms of the fact that they are actually emotional creatures 
before they are rational creatures, then we can start to think about how are we going to approach situations so that we can actually start to present the data and the evidence and the analytics in a slightly different way that gives us the opportunity to engage with people and then perhaps convince them. The first part of that is to prepare and make sure that we construct our, ash, our, our argument in a way that connects emotionally with the stakeholders. Because unless we actually engage with them at an emotional level, they're not even going to be interested in the data, in the facts. So what can we do to make that emotional connection? Well, I guess we've got to help folks fall in love with us. We've got to think about what are we hoping to achieve? What are those people that we're engaging with hope to achieve? And then try to find ways of connecting with those aspirations in such a way that they want to participate and that they feel good about what we're trying to bring to their attention. So we've got to consider what their values are. If these are really, really conservative folks, then presenting them with radical new ideas about engaging with different customer segments or bringing new products to market or offering new services isn't going to um, hit buttons for them. You know, conservative folks like things to stay as they are. If we're coming with radical options, that's going to scare them. Likewise, if we've got folks that are really enthusiastic, entrepreneurial, you know, engaged, then coming with a risk-based story, one that concentrates on compliance, uh, regulatory impacts, and so on, risk mitigation isn't going to connect either. So we've got to think strongly about where are our audience coming from in terms of the things that they hold to be valuable, both at a business level and at a personal level. We've got to think about their belief systems. How do they approach things? How have they formed a view of where they fit within the world? If you've got a marketing director that really, really thinks that they're the uh, most important person in the company because they're the one that's influencing the way that the uh, customers are in interact with us, going to that marketing director and showing them information that shows that their uh, approach has been flawed is going to challenge their sense of self, is going to challenge their beliefs about themselves, and that's not going to end well. You know? If we've got folks that are highly religious, for example, bringing them information that actually challenges their view of the world in terms of how religion influences the choices they make in their lives, similarly, is not going to go far. So we've got to take those beliefs into account as well when we're starting to frame up the way that we want to engage. And we need to think about what outcomes folks want to achieve. Yeah. What are the benefits, the value that we can deliver? And that comes in two flavors. You know, we can present corporate benefits, the collective benefits, the outcomes that are in it for the organization as a whole. And unfortunately, even at that level, most organizations that Gartner comes across don't position their data and analytics in the point of view that presents where the benefits are expected to come from. In fact, our latest research shows that only 15% of data and analytics strategies have any form of identified business benefits stated within the data strategy. The data strategies that we see, what do we want to do and how do we want to deliver it rather than asking and answering the question, why are we planning to do this? But even if we can articulate those collective ways, 
actually go and do things. You know, what gets people up in the morning and motivated to act is what. Because ultimately, just we're all pretty selfish creatures. So we're trying to from having done some analysis, change the way things operate by bringing that evidence to the air and saying that the take into account how it's done. Alan, I need to interrupt you for a quick bit here. We're getting about every other word. We start getting some feedback there. Hello, can you hear me? I can. If you speak a little more, let me. I'm not sure if it's coming through clear. Oh, now I can't. Looks like we're, we've lost them for just a moment. The challenges of overseas. <laughs> Alan is is uh, speaking from uh, the UK today. Apologies, folks. We'll get this Alan back on and running for uh, here in just a few minutes. And yes, to answer the most common uh, question there, uh, we will be sending a follow-up email by end of day Thursday. Hi there. Like... Sorry, Shannon. It's it's Alan oh. back. Um, the the yep. the line dropped out completely. So apologies for that. And uh, hopefully we're now uh, much we're better. Can, no, you, can you hear me better? Yeah. 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 Very clear. There we go. Perfect. Okay. Thanks, Alan. <laughs> That's so apologies for that, everybody. Um, so yeah, so just framing up there the fact that we, we need to be able to um, look at not only the, the benefits to the organization or the benefits to the company, but also the benefits to the individual. Um, because it's, it's the benefits to, to me as an individual that actually influence whether I will choose to act on the an analysis, act on the data or not. So some examples here that help put that in, in uh, a little bit more detail perhaps. So if the benefit to the company is being able to increase revenue from sales penetration of new products, then what motivates the sales guys to actually do something is the prospect of being able to uh, participate in the end of year sales incentive or winner's circle. You know, project managers, motivated not by just achieving on time and on budget, but that becomes a personal benefit in terms of getting promoted to a more senior job grade, and so on. Now, we can frame any organizational outcome in terms of the individual outcome that potentially acts as a motivator to the individual that we're dealing with. Now, that means, of course, that we have to think very carefully about who our audience is. And maybe Alan, I'm going to interrupt you again. Yeah. <laughs> We're running into all kinds of issues. Um, I just lost you in your screen. You got um... – The screen's gone. Let me try resharing again. You're no longer – yeah. Yeah. Is that – has that worked? No, I'm afraid. Uh, <sighs> apologize, everyone. This is. Uh, I don't know what 
I can do here, share my screen, monitor two. No, it's, uh, I'm gonna, share I'm afraid you may need to log back into WebEx. You, need, you, you want me to log out and log back in again? Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, folks. <laughs> What's going on today? Okay, I'm sorry, everybody. But I'll, I will. Uh, I'll, I'll do that. I'll drop off and uh, I'll come straight back in, Shannon. And apologies to everybody for the technical glitch. No worries. Thanks. Okay, so I should be able to stay on the line, so at least everybody can hear me, yeah? Yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Okay, so I'll give this a try again. Well, you know, that's just sometimes how it goes. Works perfectly in rehearsal, but... <laughs> <laughs> What can you do? Yeah, you know, technology is great when it works. <laughs> okay, so if I... There, you have privileges again. Go with that. There we go. All and right. Everybody, all right? Take three. Fingers crossed. <laughs> okay. Right. So having having framed the idea that we need to, need to identify the uh, narrative, the outcomes that are uh, appropriate for each individual stakeholder, I also want to raise the fact that one of the biggest inhibitors to having a productive conversation with folks is the fact that we say no all the time. So if there's any folks out there who are uh, project managers or who deal with project managers, you know, you'll typically hear whenever you come with a new requirement, no, I can't do it. No, it's not in scope. No, we don't have budget. No, we don't have resources, et cetera. Yeah. And that really, really turns folk off when they're trying to uh, engage with you. If we spin that around and instead say yes, and the impact is going to be more budget is required, or yes, and the impact is going to be we need more resources, yes, and the impact is going to be it'll take another three months, then what we do is we give the requester uh, more power, more influence on how they feel about what is important to them, rather than taking power away. So when we're trying to engage and when we're trying to get people's participation, it's really, really important that when we frame up the requirements in a way that delivers on those business benefits at a corporate level and at a personal level, we also use the language of yes and. Alan, I'm so sorry. We, we lost your screen again. Can you reshare? I've got you still here. I don't know what's going on with Lemon. It's uh, seriously misbehaving. Oh, my. I really don't know what to say. Yeah, I still got you. I still got you as presenter still, so that's that's good. I've added. I think, yeah, there we go. Okay. Back again. Okay. Yes. <laughs> oh boy. So don't say no, folks. You know, you'll uh, you'll upset people. Say yes and. Okay. So that was sharing a little love when we're trying to engage with folk. The next thing that we need to think about is the fact that the way our brains are wired at the neuropsychological level, at the neuroscience level, kind of gets in the way of listening to the facts. So even if the, the narrative is good and we like the outcomes we're targeting, we don't like to think too hard. So we've got to push on and we've got to bring them in a way that bypasses the amygdala, which is the fear, fight, and flight response, which triggers about a thousand times faster than any other part of the brain. Um, we've got to overcome that because if we don't recognize that the first 
brain activity is the amygdala, the fear response, then we don't get the opportunity to engage the more uh, intellectual part of the brain. To cut that all short, we've got to make folks feel safe. So we position things in a way that are non-threatening. Yeah. We don't come with just the blunt facts. We've got to do some work to think about what threats folks are going to experience, how they might feel about things, and where their fears might lie, and frame the discussion, presenting the information that we want to present them, in a way that doesn't trigger that amygdala response, doesn't trigger that fear, fight, and flight response. It's only at that point we get to have the opportunity to have the discussion about what is the information telling us, how do we um, approach this um, at a more rational level, and can we start to make some decisions. So some examples of that presenting the, the facts and data in a feel-safe manner, yeah. the blunt statement might be that, hey, the sales figures are down by 20% from last quarter. When you present that in that form, that bluntly to the sales director, what he hears or he or, see, he or she hears subconsciously is, you're not doing good enough job in managing the sales pipeline. That's a threat. So we have to position the discussion in a way that bypasses the threat response along the lines of, hey, can you help me understand what these sales figures mean? What could we do about this and how can I help you? Non-threatening, feel safe. Yeah. And so on. You can see the examples here on the screen. And I'm sure you can imagine situations in your own environments where the data the analytics you've performed kind of indicate that something different needs to be done, but presenting the facts in a blunt manner is going to upset folks and actually make them resistant to the change that you want to bring. So go back to your own situations and think about how you can structure the way you engage with folks in a less uh, uh, confronting manner and make them feel safe. Now this sounds like a lot of work, right? And I'm afraid to say it is. But if we want to have influence, if we want to have effect, then we've kind of got to do the thinking on behalf of our audience and take them where we want them to go. Yeah, That's what influencing is about. It's not just about being the data factory and presenting the content and saying, hey, now your job yeah, if we actually want to influence with those analytics, we've got to work out what the narrative is that connects to, to what the folks want to do and make sure that they don't feel threatened in, in the way. Now, going a stage further, we actually have a whole bunch of brain functions in terms of cognitive biases that get in the way of us being able to deal with the truth. Our brain has pro been programmed over years to be dumb. Yeah. We have a whole range of presumptions, of predispositions that get in the way of our ability to deal with the facts. And if we come with facts that challenge those mental models, we actually feel bad about ourselves in terms of our sense of identity. So when we're presenting difficult information, difficult data that goes against the current point of view, we've got some real hard work to do. Yeah? And folks will resist what you're telling them even if the benefits of what the change we want to make are in their own best interests. So some examples of that. The Chevy Cobalt um, incident, where Chev Chevrolet ignored for almost 10 years the fact that they had faulty ignition switches in their Cobalt motor cars. For 
10 years they ignored that data. They suppressed it. They just couldn't get on with the fact that, that this was a problem because of the, the potential impact, they thought, to their reputation, the cost of recall. Unfortunately, in leaving it for 10 years, 124 folks died as a result of these faulty Chevrolet cars. Class action lawsuit for hundreds of millions of dollars, together with having to go and recall 30 million cars. If they had confronted the facts early enough and recognized that there was a problem here that they needed to deal with early, they would have avoided a huge situation. We've got folks down in North Carolina where the climate forecasts are predicting that there's going to be significant coastal erosion. Now, that clearly is a benefit to folks in terms of warning them what's coming so that they can start to take action. But the community in North Carolina has actually tried to get the climate forecast uh, suppressed because it's having an impact on house prices. We've got the situation uh, coming almost US-wide now where there is a resurgence in preventable diseases because of the misinformation around vaccinations. Yeah. And the, the, the mistaken belief that there is a connection between vaccine and autism. Indeed, the only um, report that drew that conclusion by a British doctor, Andrew Wakefield, has been completely discredited, and he has been shown in court to be a liar and a charlatan and a fraud, yet the misinformation persists around vaccinations because it's an easier thing to, to look for in terms of um, the causes of autism. You know, it's a seductive lie. And so on. Misinformation uh, on AIDS programs in South Africa, and indeed in almost any situation. Nine out of ten executives will ignore the data if it contradicts their current existing point of view. So what all this means is if we're trying to influence with analytics and influence with data, we've got a huge amount of work to do to overcome all of those biases that get in, in the way. And here I'm just presenting a list of potential uh, cognitive biases. The model that that forms in the brain in terms of the way that somebody will approach a situation and some examples of how we can overcome those biases by approaching the presentation of information in a particular way. We don't have time here um, today to go through these in detail, but of course, as Shannon's saying, we'll be sending out the pack uh, or the links to the pack later, so you'll be able to um, to pick these up and uh, and and examine them uh, after the fact. The final thing I want to talk about today is the fact that really we as data professionals and as analytics professionals need to be taking the lead in bringing more critical thinking, in bringing more skeptical scrutiny to the way that our organizations operate. In some respects, you know, we are the coach of um, data-driven thinking. You know, we've got to go beyond just presenting the data and saying, there it is, it's your choice now. We've actually got to really bring an attitude that is introducing and coaching and enabling and facilitating more critical thinking into our organizations. We've got to watch out for a few traps. So <laughs> I started out today by talking about appealing to folks' emotions and actually thinking about their emotional response as a means of getting their attention and a means of getting their engagement. However, if we are trying to bring particular information to, to the organization, we've got to be careful that our audience isn't 
uh, refuting our ideas using an emotional engagement approach as, the, as their um, counter argument. So let's be careful that folks aren't using that emotional response uh, to counter the way that they're, uh, they're receiving what we're presenting to them. There's the burden of proof challenge that um, when you go to, an org, uh, to someone and you say, uh, you know, that they are wrong, they'll immediately flip that back on you and say, you've got to prove that they are wrong rather than them saying that they have to prove that they are right. So this is where, for, for example, the folks who um, uh, struggle with um, evolution uh, would use the burden of proof fallacy to say, hey, you know, I'm, I'm sure in my, uh, my non-belief of, of evolution, it's up to you to prove that evolution exists rather than presenting evidence and information that proves it doesn't. So let's watch out for the burden of proof fallacy. And the last bastion um, of uh, someone who is losing an argument, the ad hominem attack. So they, they, the, there are no facts, there are no details, there's no other uh, way of engaging to, to counteract your argument. So they start to attack you as an individual, they start to attack your credibility as a person not actually anything to do with the topic at hand. And we see this one an awful lot in politics where it's the character of the opponent that is attacked rather than what the opponent is actually saying. So let's be aware of the fact that folks will use these kind of uh, fallacious arguments in trying to refute what we are presenting and we've got to watch out for those and then be in a position to counter them if they appear. And again, a range of other fallacies here, you know, what impact they can have in terms of misdirecting the discussion, and some examples of how we can manage the discussion in a way that presents the data to overcome those logical fallacies. Like I said earlier, we are really championing the need for critical thinking within our organizations. We are bringing together the skills and the facilitation to have a different sort of conversation based around thinking clearly, trying to bring some rationality on the situation, like bringing the facts, but also being reflective. Yeah and looking at the situation and looking to see where new information is coming to light that maybe needs to change the way we think. So critical thinking is about bypassing or, or overcoming entrenched views, you know, looking for connections between ideas, being able to understand and construct good arguments that are fact-based, but that also engage with the stakeholder uh, points of view. Identifying where there are challenges to not just the reasoning of our audience, but our own reasoning, and what can we do to overcome that. Take a systematic approach to problem solving. Understand the uh, materiality and importance of ideas. Um, this is a really, really big one. Um, I see a lot of organizations, for example, you know, arguing about the fact that the sales director's uh, situation says we've sold $100,000 worth of products this month, and the finance director saying, oh, no, you've only sold $98,000 worth of products this month. And then we get into an argument about trying to reconcile why there's a $2,000 difference between the sales director's point of view and the finance director's point of view. Yeah. That $2,000 uh, discrepancy may not be material, though, if you then compare the fact that six months ago we were selling $150,000 worth of products. So that, you know, it's up to us as the critical thinkers to call out 
things like, is there actually a material difference here in terms of the decision we're trying to take? And what's actually important in terms of the, the things that we need to, um, to act upon? And we can be the arbiter and the broker and the facilitator of bringing some of that um, some, some of that relevance to bear so that we're not just focusing on the details, but we're actually focusing on the right parts of the details. And I guess finally, critical thinking means that we've got to be absolutely ready to challenge ourselves. You know, if somebody brings additional data to the table that changes the position that we've taken up to now, then we've got to be pragmatic enough to be able to recognize that and adapt accordingly. Yeah. So there is no room for dogma here. Yeah. If we are really trying to influence with data and analytics, then we've got to make sure that we apply that to our own situations first and foremost before we ask it of other people. The last thing I'm going to suggest um, is that all of this wraps up in our ability to tell stories. And if we learn to tell more effective stories that engage the audience, then that's really what makes information stick and gets folks on board to actually do something about it. So here we've got a billboard in uh, Times Square for uh, Inception, the um, Christopher Nolan film. That film cost $100 million to make and was all about the idea of implanting ideas in the people's subconscious, you know, using, using a machine to do so, so that we can tap into people's dreams at various levels of subconscious and then being able to plant ideas that we can then take advantage of later. Telling stories does the same thing, but it does it for free. And stories are important for two reasons. The first is that if we create the narrative, then what that does is it creates a framework in our audience's brain for us to then hang our information from. Effectively, we're constructing the, the, um, the foundations that our stakeholders can then tap into. So a good story builds that narrative that allows us to connect with the underlying data. The second thing that a good story does is that it engages emotionally, again, with our audience and makes them feel the things we want them to feel, whether that's joy or fear or hope. But a story connects emotionally, and it's the connecting emotionally that then embeds the information that we're trying to convey into our mental model. And I just ask you all for a moment to think about some of the most vivid memories that you have from any time in your life. What has cemented those memories in your mind is the fact that there was an emotional response at the time. So whether that's the joy of your first child, whether that's the happiness you felt when you got married, or the joy you felt when you got divorced, you know, your first promotion, graduating from university, all of these different events that you remember most vividly you know, will have had some kind of emotional response. And that's what has cemented that thought, that memory, and all of the information associated with that memory in your mind. So just to uh, cement the idea of storytelling and, and the power of storytelling to, uh, to embed ideas in our brain, what I'm going to say to you is that forevermore, whenever you um, hear about the idea of storytelling, the idea of using stories to engage an audience in your subconscious, the idea of storytelling will come back to this webinar and the fact that you had a Scottish guy talking to you about storytelling 
And that subconscious memory will trigger in each and every one of your minds every time the idea of storytelling now comes up. I am now going to be stuck and embedded in your subconscious memories for the rest of your lives. So I hope you enjoy that little gift. All of this comes together in terms of leading transformation, leading change, leading the way that we get success from our data and analytics initiatives. And our research shows that it is, uh, in order to be successful with transformations, 60% of our efforts, the budget, the work being involved, the time, needs to be spent on change activities and managing the change process, managing the engagement, dealing with communication, and so on. 60%. And unfortunately, all too many projects and programs fall far short of that. Yeah. And that's, I guess, why we see so many technical projects struggling to realize the, pro the, uh, the value and outcomes that they're seeking. So in summary, emotional connection, tugging on the heartstrings, helping folks to love us is absolutely vital as a first step to ensure that they start to want to engage. We've got to be careful to position our language and, and, and the way that we are framing our uh, dialogue to bypass the amygdala bypass the fear, fight, and flight response, and allow us to engage with um, the more intellectual parts of the brain. We are the champions of critical thinking. Our role is to ensure that we facilitate good discussions, good interactions that allow us to bring more critical thinking to ourselves, and to our colleagues, and the storytelling and building narratives around the data that we have and the analysis that we've done is the way to make those connections and get folks on board with what we've got to offer. For those of you who are Gartner clients, there are a number of uh, research papers that uh, you may find a value in terms of following up with further detail on this whole topic of uh, engagement and influencing. And for those of you who are not Gartner clients and indeed anyone else, I've got some recommended reading here um, that uh, all these books are available you know, from uh, your local uh, online book retailer of choice, and again, you may find these helpful in, uh, in following up and framing up uh, some, some of these ideas uh, in, in ways that become useful to you. Um, with that, um, I'll uh, turn back to Shannon and say uh, I hope that's been helpful to everybody. And if there are any um, questions or, uh, or, or, or um, things that folks want to say, then I'd be delighted to, uh, to to take some of those from you. Alan, thank you so much for this great presentation. And, and you are. The Scottish voice is embedded in my brain now for <laughs> storytelling. <laughs> I love it. Um, you know, the most popular question we always get is people uh, inquiring about the slides and um, the recording. Just a reminder, I will be setting up a follow-up email within two business days, so by end of day Thursday, with links to both and anything else requested. Uh, and the first question coming in, Alan, um, a question from Barry and IBM. Does, uh, do you have any insight on what these mean for organizational structure? Who owns analytics? Who delivers insight? Who is best placed to drive any data? data-driven transformation, um, given what you've outlined? That's a really, really good question. Um, and I guess you can probably uh, infer from a lot of what I said that actually organizational structure doesn't really help here. 
Yeah, because this is not about having big, big power, big budgets. It's not about who reports to whom. It's much, much more about the way that we engage to have an influence. So, um, you know, if you if if we look at our research, then what we're seeing is that certainly the pervasiveness and data and analytics is is becoming more and more prevalent that we're seeing, I guess, a democratization of the use of these kind of capabilities in terms of doing the analysis um, out in lines of business. Um, the IT department's role, the traditional IT department's role, is somewhat diminished as we go forward. But you know what? I would say that that actually doesn't matter because what's important is the capability to ingest understand, decide upon the data that we have, and then take action at a business level. And it, to me, it doesn't really matter where that happens in the organization as long as it's happening. So what we're talking about here is not a hierarchical or organizational construct. It's about capability. And I think that's the thing to look for here is do the capabilities to pull data together, to do analysis, and then to present that information in, a, in an engaging way that actually stimulates folks to do something different, that's what's important. Love it, sure. Uh, the next question coming in is, uh, if you get these recommendations wrong, is it recoverable or not? Can there be success <laughs> in over with someone using these guidance, or is is the bridge burned? Well, um, I guess like like any form of relationship, you know, it, um, it's easier to it's much much easier to um, to destroy trust than to gain it. Um, uh, I don't think anything is ever irrecoverable, but if uh, you know, if 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 you've created a situation where where um, you've rubbed somebody up the wrong way. Um, you know, that becomes harder to recover. Um, so I guess there is always, and I guess this is why I frame up this whole uh, session on, on influencing in the way that I do, because what I'm trying to get us all to think about is what's the impact going to be on the audience and how are the audience thinking and feeling before I go to them so that I've got a fighting chance of, uh, of framing up the discussions that I want to have with them in a way that brings them into the discussion. Um, you know, if, if, if you turn folks off, it's a long way back. And I do see a lot of um, folks, and, and, I, and I don't know how many of the balance of folks out there um, today, but, I, I, you know, a lot of technology-oriented folks and, and um, numerate Kind of folks, you know, the, the the guys who are comfortable in a in a in a quantified quantified type role, the statisticians and so on, you know, they don't take into account the emotional side of of telling the story. It can all be a little bit blunt, um, and um, you know, that's probably why we uh, we sometimes struggle to see technology projects proceed, is because the um, the, the technical folks and the, 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 the analytical folks haven't taken in, into account the, uh, the human factors. Very nice, and everyone's quiet right now. There's a, no additional questions coming in. Uh, I'll give everyone just a quick moment. Um, Alan, in the rehearsal, you and I were talking about an article that uh, Gartner put out, um, very relevant, and, and points to even further research. Um, go ahead and send that over to me. We'll get that out to everyone as well. Uh, we, we love as much. Uh, our, I know our audience loves as much <laughs> resources as possible in, in diving into the education of these things. Uh, again, I don't see anything else coming in. Everyone's very quiet today, very unusual for <laughs> our audience. I appreciate you. Um, I'm sorry for the technical difficulties today. I'm not sure what's going yeah, on. Yeah, for sure. Um, but, uh, oh, here we go. have come, one coming in. How do you deal with people that attack the person instead of the facts? <laughs> well, the Scottish approach would be to invite them out to the car park for a fight. Um, that's probably not going to be a, a winning position uh, in the long term, um, though it might be tempting at times. Um, 
I think the, 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 my advice there would be to, to start out by trying to diffuse the whole discussion and say, you know, something along the lines of, hey, if you're not in a, if, if you don't feel like talking about this right now, let's leave it till later. You know, tight. If we buy folks a bit of time to calm down, then that's an immediate way of, um, of uh, you know, at, at least allowing us to regroup. Um, I think we then want to look and say, well, you know, I understand how you feel about me, or I understand how you feel about the situation. But let's then say, okay, can we look at the information we've got, and what does that tell us? So, you know, I think trying to, to take head on a, an ad hominem type attack where they're attacking you as an individual rather than what you've got to say, you know, that's, that's always, um, it's always kind of going to escalate quite quickly. So, you know, I think diffuse it as you can, which might even mean uh, a, a tactical withdrawal, um, and then coming back and, and um, saying, okay, for sure, yeah, you've got, you've kind of got to have a thick skin, you know, and 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 if somebody wants to get emotional at you in an attacking way, remaining calm, and and understanding that the reason they're doing that is because they are scared, um, you know, is um, is part to play here. Once you've, again, made them feel safe, then we can start to reposition the discussion around around the data and around the facts again. Sure, that uh, actually, that makes a lot of sense and, and certainly a good practice. Um, now, you know, in, in the modern world where enterprises are, are scattered uh, around the world, those virtual environments, how do you tell a good story if people are in different locations, especially when the stakeholders are not in the same physical location? It's, a, it's a, again, a, a really, really great question. And I think it's not even just about same physical location. It might be, you know, just how do you tell a story to two different departments that have got um, different points of view? And it comes all the way back to, I think, understanding who your, who your stakeholders are. I see a lot of uh, attempts to try and position a, a decision or position some fact finding and try and have a you know a, a view that says one story fits everybody. And actually, if you go all the way back to the questions about um, how do we engage to get folks to love us, then you know the the, the motivations that folks have, the um, the the outcomes that they desire. Um, both at a, at a team or organizational level and at a personal level are actually very different or can be. So what we've got to do here is actually recognize that there are different um, points of view, uh, teams and individuals with different motivations, maybe different speeds of adoption, um, and we've got to tailor our message, tailor our thinking, tailor the story for that audience. You know, if I can use an analogy for a moment, if I'm trying to read a bedtime story to my 14-year-old son, I'll tell a very different story to the story that I'll read to my 12-year-old daughter, but the ambition is the same, to get them both off, settled for the night, to shut up and go to sleep. So, you know, we've got our outcomes that we want. The audience has different outcomes that they want. We've got to find a narrative that connects with each individual audience on a tailored basis rather than trying to present a homogenous view, one-size-fits-all view, and expect everybody to get on board. Sure, and this next question, Ellen, it goes kind of goes back to that, you know, rebuilding of trust, but uh, from a slightly different angle, how do you try to influence someone with data who already have their minds set negatively due to being burnt financially from a similar endeavor? Maybe it's not you, per se, who lost the trust, yep. but um, somebody, some other experience that person has. Yeah, and I guess that goes back, that goes into the whole questions of, of, you know, nine out of ten executives will ignore the data if it contradicts their current point of view. 
Um, yeah, there's, there's the, the, the phrase that, that's going around the internet and Facebook at the moment, you know, haters are going to hate. Um, at some point, I think you have to recognize that, you know, there's a degree of realism involved as well. And sometimes you've got somebody who's just not interested and are never going to be. So you've got one of two options there, I think. Um, certainly, there's no point in wasting your time and energy on trying to bring those folks with you when, um, you know, when they're just never going to come. So rather than trying to find a way of convincing them, if you've made that assessment, there's only, I think, two options now available to you. Either you can try to quarantine them in some way, get them away from the initiative that you're trying to run, and, and, and find a, a place for them that diminishes their negative influence. Or if you're in a position to do so, you actually get them out of the organization altogether. Um, now, so I know sometimes that's difficult, and it depends on whether it's a unionized environment, how the culture is as to whether that's uh, seen to be acceptable or not. But you know, if you've got a, a bad apple, um, then the, in, the, the negative influence that they can have can be very, very overwhelming and very, very quickly. So rather than trying to spend too much money, uh, sorry, too much time and effort and your own emotional uh, engagement trying to bring you know, the haters with you, um, then uh, sometimes it's, um, I think, more, uh, you know, Discretion being the better part of valor is to either, like I say, either quarantine them or uh, or, or get them all, you know, uh, get them out altogether. Now that's um, that's easy to say, you know, sometimes harder to do. But if at least we understand that, then um, then we've got a, a fighting chance. I'll just give you a quote here from a chap called Scott Stratton. Now, don't try to win over the haters. You're not the jackass whisperer. Um, I think you know, sometimes that's good advice. <laughs> I think that's great advice. I think we have time here for one last question. Uh, any suggestions on how to pull together the one-off success stories into some coherent plan that gets the attention of some of the suits? Are situations the flat-out distrust um, of anything smelling of data governance, data stewardship, automated data quality. Okay, cool. So this is uh, this is an interesting one because again we have, we have a lot of conversations with our, our clients around the questions of data governance um, and our data quality and so on. And I think data quality and data governance professionals often come at it from a point of view of thinking about control, the data for the sake of the data. What have we got? How do we deliver it? And I'm, that's not really the mindset that the, the, the suits have. Yeah? They're not interested in how we do stuff. They're not interested in the disciplines. What they want to see are business outcomes. So in terms of collecting the stories, the stories are not going to be about how do we do data governance, how do we organize, what policies do we need. Those are all enabling factors for sure. But the stories to get folks on board are going to be about here's an extra 20% of margin that we made through identifying um, more clearly who our key customers are. Here's 10% of savings that we made in the supply chain by knowing more about which uh, products and services were actually costing us money and so on. Now, you can collect those success stories at a business value level in one of two ways. There will be success stories from inside the organization that we identified where there were data quality issues that were preventing us delivering to customers in a timely manner. We addressed those, and the upshot was 5% better customer retention, and so on. And sometimes you can use external case studies, the war stories of, of what other organizations have done, either in your industry, if those exist, or things that have enough connection from a parallel industry 
to to also be relevant. And I think it's a combination of the stories, the narratives, the benefit uh, uh, case from internal examples and external that can kind of grease grease the wheels of the conversation. And in terms of creating internal studies, internal examples, don't wait to be asked. Yeah. Get a hold of your data. Kickstart something. A bit of skunk works if necessary. And I know the folks out there who are kind of coming from a governance point of view will almost say, Alan, that's a heresy. You know, what, you, you can't be serious to encourage us to be doing skunk works. Where's the control? Well, you know what? Sometimes we need to sacrifice control for the sake of engagement and the sake of time to value and the sake of benefit. Control, discipline can come after the fact once we've got some momentum. So engage with the stakeholders, engage with enthusiasts, and start engaging with getting some value out of your data. That then buys you the time and the, uh, and the reputation to then start to optimize and get organized. Alan, thank you so much for this great presentation today and for the q and I'm afraid that's all we have time for. However, um, just to remind everyone again, I will be posting the recording of the webinar on the slides to dataversity.net within two business days, and I will send a follow-up email to let you know the links and the additional information requested throughout. Uh, Alan, again, thank you so much, especially being in the UK, and thanks to all of our attendees for being so engaged in everything we do. We just really appreciate your engagement with our webinars. And I hope no everyone has a day. Cool. Cheers. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time, and I, and I, uh, I, I hope and trust that that will, uh, will, you know, help you going back to your own situations. Have a great day. Cheers.